talking about uh, this idea of story. Um, and story is so important in scripture. So I'm super excited to invite my friend, Jamie Ivy. Jamie, I'm sending you the invite right now to be a part of the second half of this conversation. Um, what's up, Jamie? Hi. How are you? I'm just crying over here. Uh, this is so uh, good, Joe. This is so good. Yeah. Why? Help, help, help me, help me, help me into it. Walk me well, into it. I'm crying. Does my audio, this is the first time I've used these. Sound okay? Yeah. I'm crying. I'm looking here and the whole brothers thing. Um, the David, the, is this me? Like, is this, is this me? Like, God, we, am I like, am I forgetting the people? Because I just, am I not grieved over things? Is basically, I'm just sitting here like, God, I don't want that. I, I want to be grieved over these things. And you're doing a great job. I'm, I, I just want to sit and talk to you. I don't even want to be on here with you. I just want to sit and listen, actually. Well, here's, here's one of the reasons why I was so excited, Jamie, for you to join. Um, first of all, um, I have a very, very important question for you, Jamie. All okay. right. Um, who is better at the game of nerds, you or Lisa Turkers? Oh, hands down, Lisa Turker. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Listen, listen, Lisa's good at a lot of things. She's really good at nerds. I just need everyone to know that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually scary. And she actually um, suckers you into it, I think. She kind of starts like, hey, there's this game. This friendly oh, game. Nerds. Yeah, friendly yeah. Game. yeah that's, a, that's friendly exactly game. it. It's a, it's a friendly game. Yeah. So here's what I love about something like nerds. Like, Here's this game and I don't know anything about, but one of the things about me is that I'm so competitive, Jamie, that if I can't win at a game, like I won't I even play. play. Yeah. I don't even want to play. Like I, I actually, after Lisa beat me and you beat me at She Speaks multiple times, I went back and I went onto YouTube and I looked at strategies on how to win at the game of nerds. <laughs> That's um, hilarious. But I love, I, I love that like instantly when we talk about nerds, it's almost like, I don't know about you, but I transport back into that time i remember the day i remember you were speaking and she speaks like all of these memories come back to me and there's a story that knits me to this game that recollects all of these memories and as we've been going through amos really we've been talking about justice and we've been talking about um the reality that uh, the oppression of the poor and the powerless is not something brand new that we're experiencing today. Right. Um, that this was present in the Old Testament. So I just, I'm curious for you, did you wake up one day and just say like, oh yeah, justice is, a, is an issue for me today. Has this always been part of your story? Like help me interact with, because I follow you on Instagram. I know that this is important for you, um, but connect us to the story. Like why, why is this important to you? You know, I, I knew that we were going to talk about this and it got me thinking, you know, back to my early years and the things that God has done in my life. And honestly, I grew up in church. I've been in church my whole life, um, like just a church kid, you know, but I didn't start following Jesus till I was 21. Um, and I had this kind of radical transformation of turning my life around and following him. And it wasn't long after that, that I took uh, my first trip to, you know, on a mission trip with our church. And, you know, the, the thing that is hardest for me when I had this conversation, I think it might even be why it was leading me to tears, is that I think that you can grow up in America. I think you can grow up in church. I think you can grow up in a certain, like, economical class maybe have a certain skin color. And I honestly think you could go your entire life and not, and you, you would not be grieved over what's happening with um, poverty, with um, people who are lacking other things, with justice issues, with race issues. And so that's what makes me so sad is because I look back and I think, man, it took me 25 years before I ever realized that there was another world besides the one I grew up in. And so to answer your question, I think it was just kind of like growing and mature in my faith, having people expose me to 
different parts of our world, different parts of my city that I live in. And then I'd say even over the past 10 years, God has done so much more to bring me in situations and to have proximity with people um, who are different than me. And that's what's helped me care and want to know about um, justice issues. You know, I was thinking today, my mom has always served. Like she is like always serving, always doing things. Like for years she served at this local halfway house and she would go and cook all the time. But I have a very vivid memory and it's weird because I don't know what it is about me, but I, I don't have a lot of memories from growing up. I just, I think I have a bad memory. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I have a very vivid memory of us being at a park and there was a kid there. And I remember that it wasn't like a kid that I knew or hung out with. It kind of, he felt like a loner a little bit. And there was a huge accident. It doesn't matter for me to go into it. But my mom is the only one that was at the park that jumped in to help him. She took him to the hospital. She did all these things. His parents were not involved in his life. So it was a kid that was very, quote unquote, different than me. And I saw my mom do that. And I'm 42 and I had to have been eight. And I have hardly any other memories when I'm little. And that sticks out to me so much. And I think about that. And I think I watched my mom time and time and time again, care for the least of these in whatever way that she could. And so even though it might have taken me till I was 25 to kind of wake up to the injustices of our world, my mom was constantly doing that in her own way as I was a child growing up. And so that had a huge impact on me, um, yeah. even if it didn't come to fruition till I was later. Yeah, no, that's so good. I I'm curious, because this is something that my wife, like Britt and I are really trying to navigate. Um, you know this, we've got three little boys and a brand new little baby girl that's four months old. Um, and I'll be honest, sometimes it's terrifying. Like there's a certain sense of terror that I have as a dad in relationship to my kids. And so, um, you know, I'm Indian. I don't know if everybody knew that. I'm Indian, just so y'all know. Uh, my wife is white and our kids are really all the different shades, you know, that, that you can get from dark to super light. They all have a great tan. So that's, that's the good news. Um, <laughs> But I realized like one of the things for me is that um, I never knew anything other than being in diverse relationships. Like mm -hmm. early on, some of my earliest memories, like my group of friends, I had a friend who was Filipino, I had a friend who was Korean, I had a friend who was black, and I had a friend who was like uh, Latino and I mean, we're all there. So in the yeah. summer, it was amazing, Jamie, because honestly, all the grandmas would come, you know, visit in the summer. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you want Filipino food? We're going to Ray's house to have yeah. pasta, you know, or a double chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys want to have Indian food? Come to Joel's house, you know, my yeah. mom's going to, or grandma's going to make Indian Indian food. And you had just mentioned that proximity, that, that, mm -hmm. that importance of proximity as a mom and as you are leading in ministry, can you unpack for us, um, like, how do we even go about starting something like that if we look around and we're like oh i'm not, I, this this might not look like what my reality is right now and i want this to be authentic like yeah. i don't want this to be a show like what have you walked through in that time span where now you would say yeah this is kind of a reality for my life yeah i think it's important to think through because i want my kids to have a worldview that equals the worldview like i want them to know that the privilege that they have and the life that they live is not normal in our world, in our country, in our city, uh, fill in the blank. And as a parent, I think we always want to like give our kids things we didn't want to have. And there was something I struggled with when I had younger kids was I was like, I don't know if I want them to know about certain things because then they know and then it's hard. And we've worked through that a lot. But for us as a family, one of the things is, man, we've taken um, a handful of our kids as they've gotten older to visit different countries. Um, and I know that in itself is a luxury that I can get on an airplane with my kids and fly to Kenya and Haiti and Rwanda. Like I am, I get that. Uh, but because we can do that, that's something that's important to us. Um, you know, every Friday I go down and clean a hand washing station in downtown Austin. And, you know, I bring my kids with me and it's not, I want that to become something that where they see these are these are real normal people like when we go talk to the homeless man down there when we're cleaning the hand washing station it's not a weird scary thing it's just this is his life that he lives and we care for him because like you said earlier because of how we're all created um, yeah. in the image of god and so i want to expose my kids to the real quote unquote real world um and the life that we live that you live and i live 
it's not real. It's not the what most of the world lives like. And so yeah. whether that means from trips, from books, from movies, from conversations, I just want my kids to be exposed to that. Now we have a kind of a different situation is that three of our kids joined our family through adoption to international adoption. And so there's this real reality of poverty uh, for some of my children, because yeah. they know the country that they came from is one of the most impoverished countries in the world. And so, and what country is that? Like how, like walk us Haiti. through that. Haiti. Haiti. Yeah. 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 So one of the poorest countries, it used to be the poorest. It still might be. Um, I'm kind of behind on my Haiti, like up to date things right now, since we're here and everyone's home. Um, but you know, it's just that, like, I want my kids, when you were talking about the banquet with Joseph and the brothers, and if we walked up on that scene and we saw the brothers, we're like, this yeah. is a beautiful picture. Like, look at this great family. But behind that, you know, there is Joseph in the pit, scared for his life, naked and afraid. And it's like we want, as parents, we want them to just see the banquet because that feels safe. Mm. It feels safe to just watch the banquet. Right. And it feels scary because it's like that Sarah Grove song, like you can't undo what you've seen. Like I, 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 I can't not know what I know now. And so as a parent, I think we have to get out of, we have to become uncomfortable with letting our kids see the pit. Yeah. Um, and it's hard because also you're like, well, I don't know what to do about the pit. Like I can't solve all the problems. I'm just a, like a, a mom trying to raise four kids and I don't know how to do this, but to let them see that, you know, like my kids, there were a handful of years that I served at our county jail every single Tuesday. And my kids knew that. And so it's like, there's this reality that mom loves the ladies at the jail. And once I had proximity yes. to women who were incarcerated, you know, it started to change my ideas about incarceration, wow. my ideas about the justice system, my ideas about social work in our cities. And so it's, it's entering into the pit baby we could say it like that viewing the pit and then entering into it and exposing our kids to it is hard because then it's sad and, and then you have to come to the reality of like well what do we do about this and how does yeah. god fit into this scenario and so yeah i'm not it's not easy but it's i think it's worth it i mean and then because because how you made the correlation to to you know jesus and matthew we're like oh but he has something for all of us and so if he has something for all of us he has something for us to realize the pit and we get to ex introduce them to Matthew 26. Yes. You know, um, I don't know if you ever do this, Jamie, but sometimes when I read stories, I played the what if scenario. You ever uh, do this? Oh like, yeah. If, you know, uh -huh. like what if, uh, because the human reality, there's, there's, there's this here, we read stories sometimes and we just read the words on the page, but there's so much more that's taking place inside of the story. These are real people. Yeah. So I think of Joseph, I think he's screaming. <laughs> like, mm. I think he's terrified. He's pleading probably for his life because he realizes at that point, like, oh boy, this is, this is serious. I wonder, because you're talking about the pit. I wonder what would have happened if the brothers actually recognized um, that, you know what, they were hurt. I, I want to mm -hmm. legitimize the brother's hurt. The, the, Joseph did some things that was irresponsible, right? right? Mm -hmm. But yet their response was so not right. What right. if they actually went in and, and lifted him out of the pit? And I think of that illustration that you just gave with your kids, and I think of what can we do practically. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something, so if there's like a series, there's something so important about one intentionally being aware that there is a scene that is bigger than maybe what we see and then second yeah. being able to identify where the pit is and that the pit is real there's a legitimate pit it doesn't help us to not pay attention it's like the ostrich that puts his head into the sand yeah. right like there is a pit but then here's what i'm worried about is we're aware of the pit and yeah. yet that awareness doesn't lead us to action right and so I'm thinking with my children, what you just described, especially in the example of the incarceration and with these women, um, it's like, no, because I'm now aware of it, the gospel actually compels me 
to take part in being Jesus and, and acting in the way that Jesus would act to these individuals. So I'm going to participate in an activity that says, even if it's going to cost me something, I'm going to reach out my hands and I'm going to work to bring somebody out of the pit. And I think if we can actually engage our kids and have them be a part of that process, I think it could do something monumental for them. Um, here's a question, though, that I have. What are the dangers? Because we've been talking, like you just talked about the incarceration. You talked about um, the the memory with your mom and and, and how she impacted you early on. Um, what is the danger of looking at justice without the story? Like, you know, what if we just looked at the justice by itself? Or let's just use the opposite. What if we just look at the story by itself? Um, is like, is there a danger with that? You know, I don't know if this answers your question or not, so I hope that it does, but you told me you're going to ask me that, and I've been thinking all day, like, what is this, what, what, how do I relate to this? And here's what I have to say. Stick with me for a second, okay? Remember 1994, if I say Ford Bronco, what do you think of? The, uh, the Denver Broncos. Well, that was good. See, you would. Okay, let me try this again. OJ Simpson, okay? Oh, uh, yeah, murder. Okay, so, Murder. <laughs> Here we go. Just stick with me for just a second. Okay, okay. I'm in oh, high yeah, school. Oh, yeah, Denver Bronco, because he's in the highway. He's, he's in the in highway. The Bronco. He's he's, going, yeah, yeah. I remember watching yeah. that. Okay, thanks. That I'm was a bad involved. setup for you. Don't no, worry. No, that was good. So I remember this. I was in high school, and our teacher uh, played the um, – when the judge came out and gave the verdict. They played it in the class. And – we all know what happened, you know, looking, we can look back all these years and see that OJ Simpson, he was, he was found guilty in a civil trial. He probably did kill his ex-wife and Ron Goldman, but at the time he was, he was acquitted and we saw that happen. And in my classroom, now I'm 15, 16, it, there was a divide. Mm -hmm. All the black people were on one side and all the white people are on one side. Wow. And when OJ Simpson was acquitted, Every black student in that classroom went crazy excited. And I remember thinking, are we kidding me? Like, it is so evident that this man murdered his ex-wife and Ron Goldman. Like, I don't understand why we're cheering. Looking back now with a little bit of history under my belt and a little bit of understanding about racial injustice in our country, what was happening in that classroom was that these black students felt seen for the first time because they have years and years and years of injustice against them. I would bet a lot of money if I interviewed some of those same students that they would be like, OJ Simpson did it and that's pretty crappy that he got off, right? Right. But in that moment, they felt seen and heard because for centuries, no one was listening to black people. And here they have this all of a sudden, oh, this, we have a victory. We, we have won at something. Yeah. And again, I, I'm, don't misunderstand me. By no means am I saying that what happened in that courtroom was right because I now, I thought then, and I still think that OJ Simpson was guilty. That's beside the point. The point is without understanding the history of black people in America, it seems foolish for them to celebrate a potential murderer being being acquitted right and so that was this example that i thought of and i thought wow without the story you you don't understand their pain mm -hmm. and you don't understand what they were feeling as justice take out the legal system they felt justified all of a sudden and they felt that that they had won and so i think that's important for us to realize and you know we can talk about 2020 right now with all of the um chaos and mess and craziness that's happening in our world. And I personally am, am happy about some of the, some of the upheaval that's coming because I think it's bringing stuff to the surface and people yeah. to stay in our analogy are seeing this pit for the first time. They've yeah. just seen the banquet and yeah. I was like, Oh, there's a All pit good. behind the banquet. Yeah. 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 And so I, I think about that even right now is that if, if we forget the past history of America, then this feels kind of crazy what's happening. But if you look at it through the eyes of our black brothers and sisters, you can go, okay, I can see things a little bit clearer now. And that yes. is this story that we needed to get us to 2020. A lot of white people are going, well, this doesn't make sense. Why are people acting this way? And you go, oh, when I look back and see 400 years, okay, now I can see it a little bit.
So I think that the stories of past and what we've been through affects today, you know? That's so good, Jamie. I think one of my, one of the things that I've, I've, I've shared a lot is this idea of a theology of remembrance. And yeah. um, I, when I think of the Old Testament, and I think about the Israelites, one of the biggest um, just indictments against the Israelites is that they're quick to forget. They're forgetful. And so every time it's like, you know, even, even the prophet Habakkuk, which is like this tiny little book, uh, minor prophets, like a couple pages long. And right before God gets ready, he's like, hey, Habakkuk, by the way, um, before you even go this, go ahead and write all this down. You know, like, I think there's something funny there, too. But um, the people are quick to forget. Yeah. And I feel like what you're talking about is if we forget our story, mm. if we get the story of actually our brothers and sisters, it, it actually serves as the barrier between us and the empathy that's required in order to actually step into somebody else's story. Yeah. And when we're able to step into their story, um, it actually becomes our story. Yeah. And when it becomes our story, like we care, you know, yeah. um, a quick example, right when like the Black Lives Matter um, protests were going on and when um, everything was going on, I remember driving uh, in the van with my uh, children, my three boys and uh, MJ and Britt, and we're driving and we got to an intersection. And at the intersection, there were um, a group of people, uh, both black and white, and on the one side, there was a group of um, black kids that are out there. I think it was right next to a high school. And then on the other side, there were a group of white kids that are out there. And they were all pro they were all saying Black Lives Matter. Like, that was their thing. Uh, they were saying the statement, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. like, like, black lives, individuals, image bearers, their lives matter. And I remember looking, and Levi said, hmm, my middle son, Levi, he said, and he goes, Dada, that's so good. And I was like, huh, what's so good? And he goes, the, the white people over there, they're, they're holding up signs that are saying Black Lives Matter. And I was intrigued. I'm like, mm -hmm. Levi, why? I mean, but you see the, the, the black kids over there holding up. And, and this is what he said. And I was like, oh, my gosh, so profound for my son. He goes, Dad, of course, they're holding up signs because they're black. Mm. What matters even more, Dad, is that the people that don't look like them are the ones holding up the sign because yeah. then it actually shows that their lives really matter. And I'm mm. like weeping. I'm like, I look at my wife. I'm a little bro, I'm like, you did this. This is not yeah. me. Like, <laughs> like, I just got a theology lesson from my son. And I just yeah. thought, my goodness, like, yes, you know, mm. it, this idea of entering into somebody else's mm. story. Okay, Jamie, you, uh, I listened to your Instagram live yesterday with our mutual friend, Doug, and yes. you said something that I just so uh, appreciate. You said, uh, is it on third, you, when do you do your Bible study with your friends? Wednesday mornings. Okay, so I have a Thursday morning Bible study that I do, but you have a Wednesday morning Bible study. I want you to just maybe introduce us to one, because a lot of people know you as Jamie Ivey, you know, which, by the way, it's a little stressful kind of hosting the master host <laughs> of podcasts. I just want you to know, a little stressful on my part. Um, but talk to me about what is special about this Wednesday morning Bible study um, and just invite us into that. Uh, you know, we, we're not meeting during COVID, which is so sad. It's like what I miss the most probably. But I just started a, a handful of years ago saying, hey, I want to just invite women into my home. And I want to just study God's word with them for a couple reasons. A, I wanted to meet women that might our kids go to school together. That was one of my number one priorities. Number two, I wanted accountability with God's word and with, mm. you know, hanging out with other women. And number three, I just wanted to see people that I do life with love God's word like I do. And so that's kind of where it came from. And let me tell you, I have a podcast and I travel and speak and I, I do these things. But you know what we do? We do other people's Bible studies. Like we, we buy the books from, you know, Lifeway or Amazon. We put in the DVDs because it's just chill. It's really chill and relaxed. And it's, it's not um, this like open up, you know, not bring like your study Bible and bring Joel and the theology. And the reason I love that is because women really, really, really want to not feel alone. We do. We want to know that we're not alone. And when you're talking about our stories, it's where I just keep thinking, Yes, because when I'm open with part of my story or with what I'm struggling with right now, so many women will go, oh, I see myself in her story. Like I relate to that. And that's what I've seen in this Bible study is like one person will say something and then someone else will go like, me too. And that's that whole like, me too. I see this. Um, and you know, one thing you said earlier, 
and I wanted to say something then, but I, I'm going to do it now since you're letting me talk. You said, um, oh gosh, what did you say? Oh, you said like, if we don't, rem if we, oh gosh, Joel, you said something like, if we don't remember like where we've come from or our stories. Okay. I forget what you said. Look, I'm rambling now. Here's what it made me think of. It made me think of this is that when we see our stories through the lens of the gospel, it changes everything because yes. when I remember, if I look back and remember a, what happened to my life in 1999 when I started following Jesus. But if I even go even further back and remember like just the gospel that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died the death I deserve rose again. Like if I remember that, then as I go forward and walk through whatever it might be, I have to keep looking back to that. Like I have to keep remembering that. Cause if I forget that, then everything I go through, it does seem pointless. And it does seem like there's no hope when I see the pit or when I'm parenting children or when I screw up the same sin struggle again. And so that whole like looking back at just even our, our salvation, looking back at Jesus, I think that when we remember that story, like yeah. it has to affect all of our stories. Mm -hmm. And as people who've grown up, I grew up in the church. My husband's a pastor. Like it's just church all the time. Yeah. I think it can be easy for people like even you and I or people who are in the church to forget that. Yeah. And yeah. that changes everything. Yeah. That's so good. So, you know, we've been in Amos and it's been pretty amazing, Jamie, just watching how there's been almost like this community, a very organic community. I really thought that when we started the study, it was going to be like me and my five friends. You know, I had no, <laughs> I had no idea. Um, but one of the things that I've seen is the desperation to be able to do Bible study in community mm -hmm. and this idea of being able to study together. Um, but then also, Jamie, there's a, there's a bit of a stress when it comes mm -hmm. to Bible study. Cause you just mentioned, it's like, this is a big old massive book here. Uh -huh. And I don't maybe know all the Hebrew, like <laughs> there's a stress there. Um, and yet like what you had said and what we've seen in Amos is I just wonder what would have happened if those that were rich in Amos had the opportunity or had a desire um, to be in relationship with all kinds of people, not just their own types of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that you have a incredible study that you did and it's all around story. Um, mm -hmm. And so I know we're almost done here with our study in like three weeks. It's crazy. I can't believe it. We're going to be done. And people are already hitting me up like, hey, do you have another study that you would recommend? Like, <laughs> what would you do? And I'm excited that you're here because I think if I'm going to point somebody somewhere, it has to be somewhere that takes God's word seriously, but mm -hmm. also this idea of story is so important. So could you just let us know how you set up, like, it's so cool how you yeah. set up your story matters and how people can just kind of flow right into that. Oh, you're so kind. So I, I meet a lot of women in, in my job and a lot of women are thinking, I don't know that I have anything to offer the kingdom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you have so much to offer the kingdom. If you're a follower of Jesus, A, you have an amazing story because the fact that God has saved your life is worth talking about until we die. So there's this idea that we all have stories. I think stories change the world. We're reading the story of Amos, you know, and so Stories are powerful and I want women to know and believe that their story matters and that they can use it for the kingdom. And so in the Bible study, it's called Your Story Matters. It's super um, easy. It's all online. There's videos of me teaching. There's videos of me interviewing people. And then there's discussion questions. Honestly, just to let you know, it's not super in-depth. It's not going to, you're not going to need, uh, you know, your Greek study, but you're not going to need any of those things. Which people I are probably to... so excited about right now. Cause they're like, I don't, Joel, you're killing me with all this Hebrew stuff. So this is so good. I want it to be super accessible to uh, women just like me. And so it's six weeks long. We go through six different lies that sometimes keep us from sharing our story. Uh, no one will understand my story is too much. It's too big. It's too little. I'm in the middle of it. Uh, it doesn't matter. And so we just kind of walk through those and tear those down with the gospel. Like yeah. the gospel combats all of those lies. And we, at the end of it, we always see Jesus at the end. And that's, that's the Bible study. 
That's so good. Um, so you can go to Jamie's profile and then I'm sure there's the link. I think it is it jamieivy.com slash your story your matters. Story. Yep. You know that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, and here's, here's the thing. I know some of you are like, oh, Joel, COVID. I don't know if I can gather. I want to do this in community. Jamie, I don't know if you know this, but there's this thing called DM groups. Have you heard about this? I've heard about it. Yes. Okay. I am so like, you know, not cool on these things. And so I had, so apparently we've got groups of people that are doing the Amos study in DM groups. I think it maxes out of like 30 or 34. There's yeah, like multiple there's a max. People. Mm -hmm. um, but then here's what's like next week after the live teaching, I think on Friday, I'm actually going to join a Zoom call with one of the groups that's doing. So they've even taken it the next step. Yeah. So I just want to give that to y'all. If you're thinking, how do I do this? You can jump on there. Maybe you do an, an Instagram DM group and then mm -hmm. you can have a Zoom. Like there's so many ways, even in the midst of COVID, yeah. to still yeah. have that sense of community. And yeah. here's why I would say, I love what Jamie has done in the story because you even have guests, Jamie, like your friends. Mm -hmm. like yeah, your my people. real life friends. They're I like your, your people. Yeah, yeah. like mm -hmm. it's Jamie's people. And, yeah. and there's a conversation there um, because it's so important, y'all. Like this is what I believe, that the only way, like one of the only ways, like this is what Jesus has done in the incarnation, that Jesus, when he leaves the divinity of heaven and he comes and he takes on humanity upon himself, mm -hmm. he shares in our suffering and in our yeah. plight. That's why in Hebrews it says that he can be our empathetic and, and high priest. When we share our yeah. stories with mm -hmm. each other, it will do something significant in terms of our transformation yeah. because we're um, learning how to tap into kind of what Jesus has done himself. Yeah. And so I just think that this is so important. Jamie, Thank you so much for being with me. I know, um, you know, I've got a couple of favorite worship leaders and, you know, Aaron <laughs> Ivey is- I got is really one, Aaron Ivey. Yep. You know, Aaron Ivey, and I know Aaron's about to take you out on date night. So thank We're you. We're going on a date, yes. Yeah. So tell Aaron that I've got some Indian food coming your way, but Aaron can't have any. So, and he knows why, he knows <laughs> Just why. Just for me. Just yeah, for me. Exactly. Uh, Joel, thank you. Thank you. What you're doing is so beautiful and I have loved it. So thank you, thank you. Tell Brett I said hi. I will for sure. See y'all later. Bye. Um, man, it is so, uh, I'm so excited to continue to do this with y'all. So we're in Amos chapter seven next week. Um, and we're rolling just, you know, a couple more chapters to go. If you're just starting, if you're just starting uh, and you're like, oh, this is so good, but I'm kind of late into the game, I want to just encourage you. Like, you can start right now. All of the IGTV videos are available in the IGTV deal. Um, and then also, if you just sit down with the book of Amos um, in 30 minutes, right? Last week, Lisa called me on the carpet. She, LT was like, you know, Joel, I think 15 minutes isn't reasonable. So I'm going to say 30 minutes. You can literally in 30 minutes read through the entire book of Amos uh, and you can actually be ahead. Um, and so I just want to encourage you to be a part. Don't, if you've missed a couple weeks, it's okay. Um, just pick up where you are. It's just kind of like with your daily Bible reading and, and you can catch up when you can as well. Um, I'm also working on something I'm kind of excited about. Uh, because I've had a lot of you that have said, hey, how do we take all of this content and how do we put it in a like Bible study that's like a little more packaged? So uh, I'm excited. We're working on something. You can go to mudamali.com. That's M-U-D-D-A-M-A-L-L-E.com. Uh, it's just my last name. And you can sign up to the email list. And uh, I'm excited to launch something at the very end of the series that I think will be helpful because um, there's more to come. You can go get a, uh, Jamie's uh, Bible study at jamieivy.com slash your story matters. Uh, and listen, I, I cannot uh, encourage you more to be a part of that. So y'all have a great day. Thank you so much for being a part and we will see you next week. Amos chapter seven. Later.